Welcome everybody. So let's talk about chapter nine. A couple years ago, I was really big into subject-specific sound effects, and so I've been trying to get away from them. But this one I left on there, but um, this is kind of distracting. But it's also kind of cool because you can do this. And so last night uh, I was working on updating this uh, our lecture for today. And uh, I was up a little bit later than I wanted to, and like what I did was I was trying to find a cool kind of Muslim Islam um, uh, background for uh, for PowerPoint. I was looking for PowerPoint templates. I couldn't find anything I really liked, and I thought, oh, I'll check out just like you know Windows wallpapers, Islamic themed ones. And I thought, oh, hey, here's this cool one. But in the middle, there's this big there was like a crescent moon or something like that. And I'm like, ah. So I photoshopped it and just made this repeating, take the repeating pattern here and just kind of, so I did like a strip like that and then just copied it and copied it and copied it and put that on the back. That was pretty exciting. Yes. Yeah. And then the second, the other slides, I did the same. So here's another one. This had some writing on here, like all in the background, kind of like watermarks. So I took, I just took like a clone paintbrush and sort of painted over the whole thing. Uh, and then I also love, uh, my big thing is I love subject specific fonts. Defont.com is my favorite, yes. And so um, you can see here, we have, we've had problems with the computers, but just recently I was able to kind of get my fonts working. <clears throat> and so now you can see, yes, that, and my favorite part about fonts are the names. This one's called Arab Dances. <laughs> that just sound neat, you know what I mean? Cool. My favorite Greek one's called Ancient Geek. They got a whole area. A lot of them, there's a couple different font websites. The one I use, Defont, has like, you know, actually you can go to like different regions, like Chinese fonts and Arabic fonts and stuff. So, it's pretty cool. so do I have dedication? Yes, I have dedication. And I also like sound effects. See, the hard part is you have to know when the sound effects come, so you can do a quick little pause. To the button right there. The rise of Islam! Are you ready? Are you, are you, are you smelling your hair? <laughs> okay. Should I not? Because that's recorded, so should I not? Okay. That is. I have lights on because the green screen behind me, if, it's, if there's any shadows, it kind of it gets hard because it gets kind of pixelated. So for, to be more seamless, I need the green behind me to have no shadows. So that's why I have more lights on. The more lights I turn on, the harder it is for you guys to see. So the other class is more dark. Um, and so I thought I'd put a couple lights. So there's some lights still in the body, but my left leg is getting really hot. <laughs> so I got one right here, and then I got another one right there. I don't know if they're even doing anything, but I'm not going to move those hands just like here. Okay, so chapter nine, uh, the rise of Islam. Good news, by the way. Ten chapters, I'm sorry, nine chapters in our first unit, nine through ten, two through ten. We're on chapter nine, one more left of the crazy unit, okay? So after this, after chapter ten, this fast-paced stuff is over, so the things are going to be a little bit better for us, so that's good. So next time, ch chapter nine homework, chapter ten outline, and then we'll do a review, and then your test, and things are going to be much easier after that. Mm -hmm. It's online. Yeah. I'm not passing out the study against you. On the foundations page, right above all those chapters, it says I have a couple things. I'll go over them with you uh, next time. I'll show you with a chit. There's a thing on quit, a flashcard thing with all the things you need to know. There's also a study guide, and, and then when we, we'll play a review game in class, like a game show, and then I'll put the review game questions up there too. So we'll have quite a few resources up there to look at. Yeah. Um, last night I was doing some research. I found a really good website with different kind of questions. Like you said, you have like seven. Step ones. Huh? Left yeah, left. like okay. step. So if anyone wants that. All right, so uh, this chapter is about a couple things. It said the, right, the Sassanid Empire and the rise of Islam. The Sassanid Empire is not one we really need to focus on a whole bunch. Okay, it's one of those things that I'm almost going to guarantee is not going to be on the AP exam at the, that you're going to take in May. So let's not focus a whole lot on that. What I do want to talk about is the region where it's located. Okay, and where is this area? What would you call the Sassanid Empire? What major country is in there today? Iran. Iran is a fantastic song by a group called the Flock of Seagulls in the 1980s. I ran so far away. But we don't, it's actually the, the correct pronunciation should be Iran. Iran, yes. Yeah. So this was made very clear to me from my uh, college roommate, was Iranian. Does anybody know what they call themselves? 
They don't call themselves Irani of the culture that's based in. Would be Persian. Good. And uh, uh, an interesting character, my college roommate. He. Uh, um, I would listen to him uh, speak to his mother. They'd yell at each other on the phone every week. <laughs> And uh, he, made, he, he made me sure I had my pronunciation right on Iran. But also uh, an interesting character, and I've never met anybody with the same name as him until uh, I told one of my students last year who was also Iranian, and, um, uh, and his name was Shariar. <laughs> interesting, because I, because I finally was able to talk to my, my old college roommate, and I said, hey, I got, a, I got a kid here, and he's just like you. Okay. And there's a slight difference, though, is that my roommate played football with me, so he was like six seven. Uh, 300 pounds, and the other shower you heard at school is more like 80 pounds. <laughs> and so, but the personalities are very interesting because it, I was shocked at how much they are both so alike. You guys know the the shower here? Yeah. Yeah. He's very uh, smart. Shower I don't know. Everybody knows Shariar. Everybody knows Shariar. And in college, everybody knew the other shower the other shower is a little bit different because if you got in an argument or disagreement and you were like a shorter kind of guy, and he would get frustrated and so he would grab you and he would put you on the ceiling. He would literally just like put your back up and, and watch you like flounder for a while and put you down. And at that point, then you don't want to really argue anymore. So, interesting. So I actually saw my old college roommate and I told him about, hey, there's a kid who's just like it. Cool. But anyway. What are we talking about? Iran. Yeah, so here is Iran. Now interesting is, where is Iran? Look, what's this area right here? Arabia, and Arabia is uh, next to it, and, and so the empires that are going to uh, come out of here, and it, the, uh, you guys remember, there's some, uh, the empires that we need to know that come out of this um, Muhammad's uh, teachings. What were the two early Islamic empires that were created? Raise your hand, what? The Umayyad is the first, and the, and the Abbasid. Those are two that you need to know, okay? So the Sassanid, not necessarily, but we need to know the two of them. But what, oh, the interesting part I want to say is that they're, they weren't part of these early Islamic, the core where it starts from. Ultimately, they're not from Arabia. And the people there, are, would you consider Iran in the Middle East? Are, is Iran an Arab country? That's a tough one. because, And we're going to have a question here. I want you to think about it a little bit so we can get to it in about 10 minutes. What is the term Arab? Don't answer it and think about it. What is an Arab? I said in about 10 minutes, so you're going to think about it, but you got to be the first, first one. Okay, so who were the Sassanids? They were lo located there. Uh, they're going to be after the, um, right, you had the Persian Empire there. Alexander takes over, it breaks up, and the Sassanids are going to be sort of the next of, the, of these Persian people, and they'll be an empire. Uh, the official faith would be Zoroastrianism, and one of the interesting things about them is the beginning of this link between... Um, Hey Riley. Yeah. I think my battery's going. Can you come grab this and hang this up for me on the little charger over there? And then you're gonna have to be my little. Where's the charger? In the cradle next to the like, computer over there. And then can you be my? Uh, when I say next slide. Yeah. Like right now, next slide. So is it terrible podcast? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is young. <laughs> <laughs> Cut this out. Cut this out. This will be edited out. Jeffrey Clark was telling me about you sneezing. In fact, you have like 12 sneezes in a row. Another sneezer. Let's do that. Edit this out. Yeah. Good sign for restarting. So! <laughs> what? Come on. Ah, thank you. So, uh, a real close connection in the set. <laughs> Go away, go away, go away. Have you ever had a burrito at lunch that you looked at on the plate and you said, how is this ever going to fit inside my belly? And then by the time that you're finished, you're like, wow, I guess it did. Very, I didn't finish the whole thing, but it wasn't like I left the good so, It was only like that much of a burrito. So cute. Wow, that was a big burrito. No, and I don't know why sneezing made me think of a burrito. You okay, John? Sneezing most interesting podcast of all right, should we leave all that in? Yeah. Okay, I'll leave that in. Oh, you know what we'll do is I'll, I'll put a picture of my uh, friend, my roommate, Shariar. Yeah. He'll be right 
here. Okay. He'll actually show up there. Yeah. He's right here. And you want to see the second picture of him? Yeah. He's right here. Hope I get a picture of him. Well, yeah, I mean, he was the first Iranian. A true story. He's first Iranian playing the NFL. Played for the, he played uh, for the NFL? Yeah, he played, cool. he played. He played for the uh, Steelers. Did you get a picture of him like Redskins? I'll try. Okay. Uh, played for the Steelers. He played for the Redskins a little bit. Shariar Pordanish. Uh, Jeffrey in the back, can you look up Shariar Pordanish? Pordanish? Pordanish. P O U R D A N E S H. All right, so let's move on. Let's get to Islam. Wow, he looks kind of big. looks kind of big. All right, next slide, please. Okay, uh, Islam. Now, you guys in your geography classes uh, got a little primer on Islam. And I would think most of the religions, and let me just give you my little uh, preface here. So, uh, my job in this class is that we have to discuss religions, and no way am I advocating and wanting you to pick a religion, stop doing a certain religion, but we need to teach, teach, teach about different religions. I hope that I come across as being somebody who is, uh, can give you the basic information on these, as well as co modern political uh, um, uh, ideas as well. So I hope that you walk out of here, and for me, my, what you think about Mr. O'Donnell, I hope that you wouldn't know what religion I am, nor would you know what political affiliation I am. I don't mind you guessing, I think he's a radical right-wing conservative Buddhist. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and if you're ever interested in wanting to know what I am, I could tell you for sure, but I'll tell you on graduation of your senior year. And uh, I've had some kids take me up. I've gone out to sushi with some former students, and they've always wanted to ask me, and I'll, I'll tell them, I'll let you know how I feel, but my personal opinions, I just want to uh, put those aside and just teach about things. Okay? So Islam, <clears throat> I think it's important to understand all these religions. Now, why? Why do we need to learn about religions? Because this isn't a theology class or even a, a world culture class. This is a history class. Isn't like learning about other things makes you like more aware of other people and less like, um, what's it called, like prejudice? Yeah, exactly. So that's a big reason is that an understanding, and, it, and, and how has that been in the news just recently? What's happened over the past two days? The of the yeah, so it ties in with this perfectly. There's a guy, I think a pastor in Florida, and on tomorrow on the anniversary of 9-11, he wants to have a book burning of the Quran. Okay. Yeah. What's that? He said he, he said he would, but I heard this morning now he's back on to doing it. So, and, and the point being is that he is trying to make a point against Islamic extremism, but I don't think he's realizing that in many ways what he is doing is a form of Christian extremism. And um, I think that one of the goals is that as we have a better understanding of different uh, religions and cultures, helps us to be less prejudiced about that. But that's sort of a modern context how we feel. In that. But understanding about in the past, why should we understand about the role of religion in the past? Because most societies were based off of what their religious views, right? Religious views have a major what? Uh, impact on everybody's life. belief, lifestyle, politics. politics. Yeah, they're inter they're inter uh, woven with each other. Today, we all we all ultimately kind of pride ourselves that our po politics and our religion are separate. Anybody, what do you know? What we call that separation. Of separation state. of church and state. Yeah, but what is um? What I'm trying to say is uh. Uh, we're becoming less religious in our day-to-day, -day, and we're becoming more what? More secular is the word, okay? And so it's hard for us to understand a little bit, because we look at it with our own, eye, uh, our own eyes. But one of the key themes, and we haven't spent any time talking about what the themes in this course are, like ultimately what are the big picture? There's seven overarching themes in this class, and one of them is how societies interact with each other. And how societies interact with each other is still happening today, is it not? Is the United States, should we know what's going on with other countries and do we interact with them? Oh, you betcha. Us and, us and China interacting with them. The border disputes and the uh, drug cartels in Mexico, is that an issue that we should be concerned about? Yes. Or how we interact with each other. Now, what's a primary motivating factor that makes people in one state, country, whatever, think the way that they do? Religion. Particularly, like we said, the farther back in the past you go. And we're going to see how some places, what uh, Muslims are going to be the first to do, start to see their religion as their sense of what? Law. Law. But who you are. So it's your sense of identity, identity right? So people are going to kind of get away from the idea, it, it, uh, saying like the Romans would label themselves, I am a Roman. Well, in, the, in these, some of these Muslim empires, we're going to start to see religion as the key identifier. So we need to understand, because each religion has a different set of, there's some common themes in all of them for sure, 
like we talked about those similarities, but we need to understand, though, is that what's important to one religion, different values for each, and when they interact with each other, that can create conflict. What do you think is going to happen in your next chapter that's going to cause a division between the Christian world and the Muslim world, which in many ways is still being played out today? Which is what? It's the Crusades. Okay? And so the Crusades we're going to learn about next time, uh, a, major, a major event which sparks this rift between the, the, uh, the Arab world and the Western world. Okay, so let's a little, just do a little bit about Islam. Islam are monotheists. They are the next in the branch of Christian, uh, not Christianity, of monotheistic Judeo-Christian uh, gods, which started with the first monotheist, the Jews, then with the Christians, and then with the Muslims. Each of them seen the previous uh, as a foundation of their religion, but they feel that the, theirs is the final word on that. And each of the individuals they are associated are, are seen as prophets. Okay, next please. So the five pillars of Islam. <clears throat> now, interesting, you should, so you should have covered these in your geography class. The first is saying that Allah is the only God, praying five times a day, giving charity to the poor, fasting, and taking the, uh, the, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Now, interesting, so let me ask you this. So who's the founder of uh, Islam? Muhammad. Now, Muhammad is the last prophet, but he's building on previous monotheistic religions, what, what is saying that Allah is the only God? It's almost like a statement about monotheism. Why is he promoting monotheism if he's building on, up, building on previous monotheistic religions? Same God, but it's almost a point. It's the first thing that you should do. Because what do we know about the world that he was living in? Arabia, before in the 1600s. You read, read, who are those people you read about? Those nomadic what starts with me? The Berbers, okay, nomadic people who travel in around. And what kind of religion were they practicing? Were they Jews or Christians? No. So what were they, most likely? Polytheistic, right? And so they see religious uh, uh, gods in the what? Usually polytheism, you see what represents the different gods. You see, yeah, nature around you. So now we can understand what's Muhammad's purpose for the, the number one? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an affirmation to say, no, we're not going to be following this existing thing. So yes, he's building on previous religions, but in a different place where polytheism was strong. Okay? And that's going to get us to our, uh, the other thing, too, about... I want to get in a second. And the last one is that you need to take a pilgrimage to, to, to the, where this all began in Mecca. Okay. So now, what was Mecca? Well, this is where Muhammad uh, came from. Originally started as... Uh, his parents died young uh, as an orphan. He... Uh, grows up within the community, and in the community that he is in, uh, is going to raise him, and so he is going to find, a, and this is going to be important, community, because he feels that this is a, a, a strength uh, of sort of an extended family, and really should sort of be very important in society. And so, uh, it's a caravan city, a lot of the Berbers coming and going, so this is where he starts to get um, a following. And he is soon seen as somebody uh, to be respected and listened to. And the biggest thing he's going to do is that there is um, a shrine for all the different gods, a, a cube called the Kaaba, which is still there today. And Muhammad, Muhammad basically goes in and gets rid of all of the, uh, the other idols and says there is only one God, thus the statement of the first um, pillar of Islam. And so, <coughs> excuse me. He um, uh, basically makes this a shrine to uh, uh, to Allah, to the one God, and this will and this will be the most holy of places. And so, in, in essence, he is eradicating polytheism and, and making a statement there. Okay, next, please. And so, from there, he begins to have a following, <clears throat> and his message is that, like I said, there's only one God, and so forth. Uh, Muhammad's re revelations are considered to be the last, like the earlier prophets of uh, Mo Moses. Noah and Jesus, they see that Muhammad is the last of the prophets. Now, interesting here, there's a, there's a, this is a picture here, a graphic. And in this image, do you see Muhammad? Can you guess where he is? <clears throat> yes. With the, yeah, with the covering over his face. <clears throat> now, this brings up another issue, that, uh, particularly one that came in the news in about 2005. And does anybody remember what happened? There was a, in Denmark, there was a cartoon, there was a newspaper that was going to publish some cartoons that had an image of the Prophet Muhammad on there. And many Muslims became very outraged because why? Yes? Because isn't it like his face like 
The face should not not to be. How many people have heard that before? That Muhammad should you should not have. Uh, there should be no physical representations of Muhammad. So then, let me ask you. The question is why. Yes. Yes. Now, how does that go go back to what we just learned about in terms of the Kaaba and what, what people should be worshiping? One God and Allah, and not who himself or others. Because he, would, because the idea is that they don't want you to worship something that stands for something who is not God. There's only one thing that should be worshipped, and that's God. So by worshiping one of his prophets, should not be done. And so it is, it, it is not seen uh, that there should be any representation of Muhammad. Now this has changed over time throughout Islamic history, and also changes from different branches and interpretations of, of, of um, Islam. Some see it less offensive, some see it more offensive, and over time, like here we have, this is an early Arabic uh, painting done, and Muhammad is, is shown, but his face is not shown. Uh, other, other certain groups feel that nothing should be shown, maybe like a blue sky. Click on the next one, please. Or like here you can see a, sty uh, a stylized uh, piece of calligraphy that was done with um, uh, Muhammad's name. And so different interpretations and so forth, but it is the whole idea about getting rid of what's called idol worship. Don't worship something, worship God himself. Now that's very, uh, in stark contrast to Christianity, isn't it? And why? Because what is Jesus viewed as? Good, not just a prophet, but as the Son of God. And he is seen, his physical form is also a very stark contrast because his body is seen as the symbol, right? Of his faith. Okay, Him on the cross, or the cross itself, is the symbol of Christianity. Primarily because it's the focus on what that represents, which is what? And that was for sacrifice, right? Sacrificing for sins, yes? Um, were there representations of Allah, like physical forms? No. Okay. Yeah, so no so physical forms. Like, like, you couldn't see him? Like, yes, like, it's not something that can be seen, so there shouldn't necessarily be anything that could be... A manifestation of that. Okay, and then Jesus, because in Christianity he was like the weak figure, that's what people said. For sure, yes. Yeah, good point. Okay, next. All right, so now he's starting to get some followers here. And the date on this, by the way, is six hundred in the 600s, which is going to mirror the beginning of our next unit and the end of this one. Our first unit is called Foundations. It's this vague term. So we're going to go beyond, because the next unit is like 600 to 1450, but this is, it's not set in stone, because I'm teaching about something that's happening after 600. Okay. But roughly around 600 is one of these causes, what we call periodization. Test question. Periodization is these events that signify a shift in, glo in global history. Something has changed. The rise of Islam is a major shift. And so now we say, okay, we must be in a new era. Because you know when eras don't happen? They don't happen like at the year 1000 or 1200 on the dot. They always, some events have to happen. The rise of Islam is one of these. Okay, so his followers, uh, uh, they will uh, flee to Medina, okay, as they're being pushed out of Mecca. These two cities will be very important in uh, the world of Muslims. The community will stick together. There's that word community again. And from here, the, the group that stick with him on the flee for safety is going to become his uh, key core group. Okay, next. <clears throat> then we come back to that question that I asked before. Preston, you had your hand up. I'll give you a first shot at that. What's in there? Oh, I was joking. So okay. I was going to, I'm like obsessed with horses. Okay. What's that? So good. So is it somebody who speaks Arabic? Okay. Is an Arab somebody who is Muslim? Not necessarily. Can you be an Arab and be a Muslim? Yes. Can you be an Arab and be a Christian? Yes, you can. Is, and so I have a term here. There was a, 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 a guy who wrote a whole book about what it is to be an Arab, and he says, the term Arab may be used in several different senses at one and the same time, and that a standard general definition of its content has rarely been possible. So here you got a guy who's an expert on it, and he can't even say clearly what is, is it to be an Arab. It is a very vague term, so it says the easiest definition to say that an Arab is somebody who speaks Arabic, okay? But that's not satisfactory. Not, Arab, not all Arabic-speaking peoples identify themselves as Arabs. 
Okay, and the and the map that you see here are countries in green that Arab Arabic is the primary language. Okay, and the countries in blue are ones that have Arabic as a language, but not necessarily as the official one. Yeah. Uh, your friend's two sisters went to Catholic school. Oh, Shari, yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's not Muslim. No. Yeah, you found some photos? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, t I'll talk about him a little bit later because when we get to Iran, he is, uh, his family fled during the 79 revolution. So, okay, uh, back on what is an Arab. So ultimately, uh, what it is to be an Arab is, a, it, 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 like I said, it's a, it's a difficult word to define. But primarily, the people that originally started in Arabia spread, spread Islam into these regions of primarily North Africa, the Middle East. Now, do you see Iran over there in gray? And see how Iran is not considered Arabic and not even technically considered in the Middle East? So it, it, it's, it's a difficult one to kind of uh, necessarily label. Okay, next. So there's a picture of the Kaaba, uh, still exists today. All the shrines, of course, were gone except for the one shrine to Allah. Allah. And this is the number one, uh, sorry, the, the, the fifth pillar of Islam. That you be able to go visit this if it's feasible financially or physically to be able to go do that. Next. Um, now the Quran, the book, book itself, and like the, like we talked about in China, the pronunciation and spelling, the, the word Quran can be spelled different ways. And so what's interesting is we look at some of the, the religious philosophers we talked about, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. Interesting, none of them wrote their stuff. These are some of the profound religious philosophical teachers in history, and the, and the word from these prophets, these leaders, we get from who? From their followers, right? Those those who succeed and come after them. Uh, and the, the book of uh, of uh, Islam is called the Quran. Now, interesting here is that this is going to be a key component in terms of spreading what it is to be an Arab, because if one of the only real things we can say is Arabic speaking people, as the, as the religion spreads, the book itself that was was uh, deemed only to be written in Arabic. It could not be translated. No one should translate this book. Today, that is different because they have uh, changed the, uh, the, their thoughts and feelings on that to be able to, to expand to other people. So now, originally, wherever it, religion would spread, there, of course, you're having what come with it? Language. Well, that's two key components in what? In cultural. In culture. So now we're having diffusion is going to be all things cultural, religion. Uh, ideas, ways of life, all that kind of stuff. So we can start to see the world of Islam, this Arabic world, start to really spread out. Okay? <clears throat> Do you have a question? Oh, well, what is like, like people, like Muslim people, what did they, how did they spell it? Is there... There is no set particular way. You, yeah, you the said, more, right, I thought maybe like it was just like different. Yeah, it's, for a long time we saw it with a K. It's been seen more and more now with a Q, U, Q, apostrophe. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, so next please. All right, so now Islam is going to be successful in its spread throughout uh, regions. Why? There's a couple of them. First, they're easy, learn to, they're easy uh, to learn and practice, and there's no priesthood. That's the picture I have here. Now, anybody know what uh, th this particular person, their title would be? The religious teacher there on the, on the bottom, yeah. Be good, the imam, I-M-A-M. -A -A now, interesting, this is not the equivalent of a priest, okay? Is Christianity have a, str a strict priesthood? Yeah. Yes. Buddhism? Yes. Christianity? No. Uh, sorry. Islam? No. So what we have here is that there need to be people who will lead services and maybe necessarily be teachers, but it is very different than the Western idea. And all the Christian branches have them. They call them different things. Priests and pastors and deacons and so forth and whatnot. Okay. Um, and so very much different. And so it's then also what that gives is the religion doesn't necessarily have a hierarchy of individuals to necessarily follow. There's no pope, per se. There's not cardinals that are making official things. So it's much more at the what level? I said over and over, starts with the C, ends in immunity. Good. Much more of a community approach to this, okay? Community. Let's be a survivor start next week. Any survivor fans out there? Wow. Wait, I thought... Muslims were people. All peoples. Muslims were, and others that also follow the book, the Old Testament. Jews and, Jews and Christians. Um, so they allowed their, their someone inclusive to uh, the, those who came before them. Uh, of all of these that you can see there, what do you think? Could you guess? What would you highlight as being probably the number one reason that, alloc that facilitated, allocated the spread of Islam? 
Yes. Um, good, non-Muslims are allowed. Yes. Good, good. That's not the one I'm going to go for, but that's a good choice. Yes. Equality. Equality. Easy to learn. Practice. Easy to learn. We're eliminating a bunch of them. Yes. Easy. Uh, easily Ah, Particularly because of what? The next part of that. No matter. Traitors. Trade. Think about the other religions that we've learned. Buddhism and Christianity are the main ones we focused on. So, where, how does, what, what is the number one thing that facilitates the spread of Christianity? Paul doing what? Traveling, Traveling through the what? Roman Empire. Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire was very what? Yeah, but, what, but, but the Pax Romana allowed what? Safety of travel. Okay? So, Paul was able to, tra to move along easily along existing roads, particularly trade roads. Um, and what's the other one? Buddhism? How is Buddhism going to spread out of India? Via Silk Road, Silk Road trade routes, okay? A, a long trader. So probably what we see more than anything else what we can say is that these existing connections allow the diffusion of religion, okay, of all of them. And then another major component is the last one, is through conquest, okay? Where you go, culture goes with you. The word jihad, of course, has had a very negative connotation in our societies uh, ever since 9-11, as what one particular group used it as a war against non-believers and infidels as us. We're going to see jihad used quite a bit, particularly with learning about the Crusades. Um, but uh, the idea of co conquest is definitely a way to be able to spread spread culture. Next. Uh, the third important city is a place called Jerusalem. I think you probably learned quite a bit about it in geography with the whole Israeli-Palestinian thing. I should think you guys did a lot about This particular building is called the Dome of the Rock. And what's the, re what's the importance of this? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm so now let's move forward to the uh, for, uh, for Muslims here. Yeah. Oh, and didn't like Muhammad, like I said. Good. So we see Muhammad's ascent to heaven. Now, what's interesting is that this it's such Jerusalem's an interesting place because not only do you have such a small town where three the three main uh, Judaic uh, Christian religions find it so important, it's not necessarily that their important religious sites are here. They're literally on top of each other. Case in point here, if you, the next picture please. Uh, the inside of the Dome of the Rock, and another shot after this one, you can see and you get a, a larger where Muhammad was uh, said to ascend to heaven. But now if we pull out and we take a look here, one more, uh, on this particular shot here, you can see the remnants of the Temple Mount there. Okay, And smack dab in the middle is the Dome of the Rock. Now closest to me, you can see a wall. Go back a picture please. And and you can see that the only remnants of the original Temple Mount is the western wall here, okay? And that western wall is very important to Jews, and you can see uh, them down there in the bottom. And so the Dome of the Rock is going to be constructed upon that. And so you can imagine the sort of uh, religious conflict that's going to happen. And also, we learn about the Crusades, and the Crusades were all about who could control this. Yes? It's just the Jews correct to put their uh, prayers in the wall. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> and lastly, uh, Jerusalem is important to Christians, and why? What's that? Not born in Jerusalem. Where? Why? I mean, not where. Why for Jerusalem? What's the holy? The whole, anybody know what the holy building there is? It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Anybody know what the word sepulchre means? Sort of a tomb. And so after Jesus is uh, crucified outside the city walls in Jerusalem, that's where he's have to uh, and to walk through the city, he's crucified and then his body is taken in. And so this 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 church that in there is the holy for them is sort of um, the original resting place of Jesus. And so very important to the three groups, conflict's going to arise over control. What we're going to focus on is interesting in the Crusades. It sounds very religious in nature. Control of the uh, about control of a city that is religiously important to particular groups, but it's often very much a political decision to make the Crusades happen, which we'll get to next chapter. Next. All right. Now, uh, yeah. you got it here? Oh, you went behind me. I got 215. <laughs> uh, who comes over after Muhammad? Unlike Jesus, Jesus dies in his early 30s. Muhammad's going to live uh, much longer. Now, after Jesus' death, what did Jesus leave in terms of the development of an empire, a religion? What does he leave? He leaves virtually nothing except his, the, his, the oral word that he spoke to his followers, okay? His lessons that he taught. 
nothing written down, no empire created, no official religion. Okay? And it's those who come after him who are going to create and turn something out of this. Muhammad, similar or different? Different, okay? Muhammad is going to create okay, uh, a, this community that's going to start to go out and conquer others, turn this into a <coughs> definitely a, a religion that is being followed. And so then it becomes a, a, an issue, not necessarily about building a religion after him, but who's going to take over this afterwards. And originally it's this guy, Abu Bakr, who becomes his, uh, who is his father-in-law, his wife's father, takes over. And he is going to rule, not for a long time, but he's going to rule and be the first one to sort of turn this into a, uh, uh, a real formalized, a consolidated empire. And, co and continue the idea of conquest and going over others. Okay, next please. But then soon what's going to happen is the word, it's called schism. And it's fun to say, it's fun to say it on the side of your mouth. Schism means split, but it's fun to say. Is it weird? You like to do it? The other way feels weird. Doesn't it feel weird to do it prior to both ways? So, schism me split. Religion. Do many religions split? Yes. Yes. We see quite a few religions divide and split. The schism over Islam. It's going to happen after the third caliph, the leader of the religion, civil, uh, after his assassination. A civil war is going to be broken up into two different groups. Those who follow group A and those who follow group B. Let's take a look at a way to kind of remember this. And so the schism is, here you go, pew, pew. And what are the two branches, everybody? Yeah. Sunni and Shiite. Also see Shia, you may see it as well. Okay, about uh, what happens, uh, the killing of Ali's nephew. So, next here, I'm going to have a letter U. You may want to write this down. This could be a little sort of uh, a way to help you remember uh, what's specific about each of them. Which let, so, which branch do you think I'm going to talk about if, I see, if you see the letter U there? Sunni, right? Okay. Good. Now, what are some of the other words that have U in there you think that may be associated with this to help us remember? Uma and? I've said it several times. What does Uma mean? That the, community. Huh? The kid means community. Very good. Nice. Next, please. So you can see that the, who should be chosen as a successor to the prophet? Somebody from within us. That they said was so important to Muhammad. This community of followers. Let's find the best person to lead us. Okay? These will be the Sunni. Now, the Sunni are going to make up. I think it may be charged. It's not that I'm firing you, but I think that the battery may be. I'm trying to You just can't read my mind. I'm trying to anticipate that. what it is. You're trying sometimes to it's working really well, and other times. Other times. Those, and it seems yeah. like those are the times I. Uh, <laughs> what did I say? All right. And look at this 90% of the world today is Sunni. Okay. A considerable difference. Uh huh. They're not referred to as, uh, as, uh, as a caliphate anymore, no. But the caliph, though, yes. All right, so what letter do you think is going to show up for my next branch, yes? I have a quick question. What is exactly a caliphate? Uh, the, a leader, the leader of, of uh, this particular group, okay? okay. The, lead, the successor, who is the new leader of, the, of this religion, okay? But not necessarily in like a, like I said, uh, an, like, like a pope per se, oh. that is an official, but one who's guiding us, yes. A caliphate is like a dynasty. That's the dynasty base off of this, yes. And so that's what we refer to the two caliphates, the Umayyad and the Abbasid. Okay, so next vowel will be what, you think? I. So what would be the things here? What yeah. religion are we talk? about? What branch is? Good. Which is? Followers of who? Ali. And so ultimately, that Muhammad's followers should be picked from Muhammad's family. Very good. Podcast was paused all that. And Welcome back. So, uh, looking at this map here, interesting is that this shows not necessarily Islam, but what does the word say? Islam's what? So how it's spread out. Because do you think that the, the Shiite were necessarily just spread equally amongst everybody? All these different places? No. 
So would you say that the Shia religion is very much distributed or localized? Localized. And where would you say it's localized? Yeah. Good, in Iran. Let's get to that back in a second. But look at the shoot. sorry, let's look at overall green. Just where would you say, what, how interesting is this map? Because what does it tell you about where Islam is? Not everywhere. Doesn't look like it's in Canada. <laughs> Wherever it is, but why? Why is it in these places? Huh, say it. What trade routes? Do you see the Silk Road affecting this? How does it get here? Primarily Silk Road, right? Not a lot in China, some. But the Silk Road, which is this. Yes, okay, Silk Road affected these places. Good. Good. You see Silk Road up there? Good. What else? Huh? You see the Trans Saharan caravan routes here? Where particularly were these Saharan caravan routes going? East or West Africa, do you think? West, because you think it would go near the Gold Coast for the salt gold trade? Yes, so we see primarily here. We see this good. And the last one? Indian Ocean, the IOMS. Winds blow this way one season. Hey, welcome to Islam. Get on board. Then what happens? Blow me back. Stop in Indonesia. So winds blow one direction, then they blow the other. Blow one direction, and then they hit the Himalayas, they get cool, and they blow back. So these. These monsoon winds are going to do here. And look where Islam spreads to. It's all just those trade routes. Okay? Pretty interesting. Somebody have a comment or question about that? Yeah. Spain. Spain. Spain, yeah, I think they're just doing pr primarily where it is the majority. And Sp Spain, do, we're going to talk about that in a second with the Inquisition and so forth and, and the expulsion of Jews and Muslims is going to push considerable out. But a lot of Muslim more in, Moorish influence. Now let me zoom back in here on Iran. An interesting. Uh, Looking at Iran, wow, boy, it looks like most of the Shia, go back here and look at, they're mostly in just one spot, very localized, and it just happens to be right around here in Iran. Now, what does that tell us? Yeah, you got here to see So what does that tell us? What's that? Did it start in Iran? No, it didn't, right? Because we know it all begins here. Here's Mecca and Medina, the city, spreads out, followers, the followers of those who believe that it should be within the family settle in this area, okay? And that's where it's going to grow. Now, what would you say uh, in Iran, so the, the primary religion, would it be Sunni or Shiite? Who's running the country? The Shiite are. Now, interesting, this doesn't happen like I mentioned before until 1979. Just in, in recent history, in 79, there's going to be a revolution that overthrows the king that they have there and put, in a, put the religion in as the government, okay? And so one of the religious leaders in Iran, they're called Ayatollahs, and so he's going to lead a revolution. Many people, like my roommate and others, this, their family decides to flee. And um, to this day, Iran is still ruled by that. But when you hear about Ahmadinejad, the president in Iran, he is not a religious leader. He is a president, but still the religious theocracy that, uh, that has a major influence over the country. There's a lot of issues for sure, right? Okay, a, a lot of conflict that they have with the West, particularly the United States. Like when they had the revolution in 79, is because the United States had a lot of influence on there, particularly with the king. And uh, we'll talk more about it, but after the revolution, they called the United States the great saint, which isn't like, not the best in terms of, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so they wanted us to give us their, the king back so they could, they could put him on trial and execute him, and we didn't. So there's been, there's been ongoing issues, but now the issues are Iran feels that we are a, an arrogant, bullying country and not letting them develop nuclear weapons and, and being able to do what they want. Yeah? So are the extremists like mostly like Shiite? That's a good question, and we often assume that. Okay? We often assume that, that, that extremists are Shiite, and that's not necessarily true, though. Okay? But those that we have been familiar with for a long time. But in Iraq, it, we, we see separatist groups being Sunni groups as well. So one of the ones that we have most of the issues with. So it's not necessarily just one or the other. What you did see in Iran, though, was a big push towards going back to the tenets, orthodox, fundamentalists, is what we see. And so we often see the, 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 like women in lots of head covering and stuff, and sort of uh, the, the, uh, what we saw in Iran. Now, Iraq is a different story, because look at here. Other countries got a sparse population, them, but Iraq is a country, look, it, it virtually is what? It's split, right? You got Sunni and Shiite, both. So a good proportion. And we know, hey, Baghdad's right there. So look at right in major between Mesopotamia, the land of the rivers where people are civilized, we have here. So when the United States comes in, what do we do in Iraq? 
What did we do there? They had a government there, Saddam Hussein, and we did what? We got rid of him. Now, Saddam Hussein, bad dude, for sure, yes, but he is a totalitarian dictator. And one thing totalitarian dictators can do is, is control. So he controlled this ethnic, I'm sorry, religious tension through uh, mass killings and fear. So now when he's gone, okay, you have this hornet's nest that's in a bottle. The United States comes in, and guess what we do? We pop the cork, right? We kept that control. That control was there. We pop it out. We hope to be able to turn this into a Western-style democracy. And can this be a modern? Because democracy is not real big here at all. Do you think of these as democratic nations? No. So we were hoping that Iraq may be an example of that. And that's proven not necessarily to be the case. Why? Because now you got, hey, what happens when you have two groups who, if you're going to create a democracy, well, it's based on majority. The Sunni have a majority over the, the Shiite. And the Shiite feel that, hey, we need to have some representation. So the idea of juggling all of this has been a very difficult process. One idea that was discussed for, it wasn't much of one, but an, an answer could be cut the country in two. Right? We did that in India. Didn't, we, didn't that happen in India? Yeah. And that's called partitioning. And there was a discussion of actually turning Iraq into three, because in the north there's a group called the Kurds who have been demanding independence as well. So this is an interesting situation for nationhood, uh, and lots of, lots, you know, we're, we're, we just spent what about two or three weeks ago said that we're leaving it in their hands now. We're there as a security force, not necessarily an active war anymore, trying to help and see if they can build in what direction is this ultimately going to turn itself out. We don't know. This is not going to be for, for quite a few years to see what's really going to happen in Iraq in terms of its rebuilding process. And then this situation over here in Afghanistan is still a troubling one because they at least had some kind of infrastructure. This is, this is a much more um, convoluted and, and complicated area, too. So this is where we're focused on our issues. And you can see, again, religious issues as well. Yeah. But anyway. The two dynasties, the two caliphates, the first one is the Umayyad, okay? And who was who should the leader be picked from there, everybody? Sunni. Huh? Sunni, and just picked from the community, okay? So the Umayyad dynasty, and I like, there was a video we didn't have yet, it's time to watch, and they, and they refer to this as a period of a roller coaster of conquest. So do you think that's a lot of conquering? Yes. Conquering, shh. And then more concrete and concrete. And when you think of that Islamic world of conquest through North Africa and into modern day Turkey, that's what the Umayyad are going to do. All the way up even into Spain. Okay? This is going to be an Arabic dynasty that converts into Islam. And boy, they're going to go after all these things. They're going to conquer. There's not much out there to conquer in terms of enemies. There's not many unified peoples until they get up into Europe when they face some of the European. Uh, 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 nations up there. Um, Spain here is a good p case in point. So they push all the way up into the Pyrenees Mountains, up to the gates of France, the Battle of Tours, where <clears throat> they're pushed back. Now the Spanish are going to take a long time period. Look at this. From 900 to 12, 1200 and so forth, they're going to keep pushing them back until the final expulsion. They try to, Spain finally pushes out in the 1400s. Probably a, a pair of monarchs you've heard of before, Ferdinand and Isabella, the ones who uh, financed Columbus same time was when they finally get out the last of the Moors, is what they call Muslims, is when they start to turn Spain into really a, the Spain of a nation that, that, is, that is a Christian nation. Now, can you have a, a, a religion and a group of people in your country expel them and not be affected at all? What's going to happen to your culture? Blending, for sure. So a great example of blending we can see today, probably the most easily visible, is architecture because it sticks around a long time. And a test question from, I think, about five years ago was this picture on the AP exam. I was excited about it. Some of my kids said they remember seeing it, and some didn't. Um, and you know what's interesting what happened last year, guys, on the test? A picture that was on one year's test was used on another year's test. Did you guys have the Ethiopia question about the church, the underground churches? The year before you, a picture of the underground church that was, you know, the, the, the cross that was carved on the ground in Ethiopia was on the test the year before you guys, and it was on the same, it was on the test last year, too question to change a little bit it sounded like but anyway so what we can see here the point being is that you have uh, um, uh, Roman arches Western style architecture with the artwork and the motifs of, 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 of uh, North African um, the Islamic uh, uh, group that came in so a great example in Cordoba in Spain 
Then the second great dynasty is called the Abbasid, and now the Abbasid are known as the Golden Age. Okay, and you can see here, looking at this is called an astrolabe. We'll talk more about this. About sciences, mathematics, poetry, literature. This is a period where things are going to really reach its uh, zenith. This again, if it's um, uh, this is about from the uh, the, the Shiite. They're going to create a new capital city in Baghdad, and um, they're going to really start to work on conversion of those who are not Muslims. What does it mean? And uh, I have the, I have a world of a thousand and one nights. That's going to correspond with your homework assignment because the story of a thousand one nights and Aladdin and Prince Alibaba and the forty thieves and all that stuff come from this. And so you're going to read a little bit about uh, from a thousand and one nights uh, tonight. For your homework assignment and answer some questions. This was the guy, you don't need to know him. His vizier, by the way, was named Jafar. And so you're going to uh, read a little bit about this and sort of see how this was. Now, you know what's interesting is that as we see a rise of science and mathematics, they're going to do something that the West does not. How does the West deal with what Western religion, Christianity, deal with new scientific ideas? How do they think of them? Did they disregard them? As what? Like they disregard them. They scorn them. You, you, if you hear the story about Galileo and how he was put under house arrest because of these ideas, question the teachings of God in the in the in the Islamic world. This can be very much different. They're all going to be able to help explain the glory and the world that God created. And so a very different approach to science. So we have Rome is going to hit its apex of culture. Middle Ages. We've talked. About, or we've probably heard is a often referred to as a dark age, we'll talk about well, that's not the greatest term, but... And then we're going to see a rebirth, and what was that called? The age of Leonardo, or re the Renaissance. Well, in that dip down of culture, guess who's living and continuing on with all that stuff? The Islamic world. And so the Renaissance is primarily a rebirth of Rome, but it's also, where do they get that stuff from? The Abbasid, who is continuing to develop those ideas slowly meander back into Europe and create the, the Renaissance and the rebirth there. Like I said, roller coaster of con conquest, conquering all through here, up into Spain, pushing out here into uh, uh, the, uh, even into Turkey and so forth. So this is a large empire uh, conquering the Persians, uh, assassinated, and ultimately becoming an empire rivaling the size of uh, Rome itself. Okay, the Abbasid going to decline, and we'll talk about the Crusades and all that next time. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to be done with this.